Quick Shots. Quick Shots. Welcome to Quick Shots with your favourite cousins, Alex and James Fitzgerald. Cuz, anything to say? No, good to have you back. Nice <laughs> tan too. Where'd you get that in LA? A bottle. A bottle. <laughs> no, nice. Just well, no, I didn't. I just roasted myself outside in 38 degrees of uh, Victorian lovely summer weather. Well, it's hot everywhere at, at the moment. Been a hot summer. Yeah. If you're listening to this in winter, reminisce on what was. <laughs> uh, you got first question for me. Yeah, this one's from Paul. It's actually a very casual question. He goes, thoughts on investing in NDIS for self-managed super? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> thoughts? What are your thoughts? We want to know your thoughts, cuz. NDIS, not a fan personally. And I say that oh, because um, I know a lot of people have done well out of it, but um, I don't have it. Haven't done it myself. Clearly, I think it's um, not as mm. good an option as as others that you can do. And the big reason for that is because um, the cost to to invest in NDIS is mm. uh, much higher. The building costs very high because you've got um, you've got to provide extra long hallways, rails, you know, all sorts of things for um, the NDIS applicants that are going to live in the home. Um, so therefore, you've got to get a higher rent to justify the cost. And where I think it's sort of been a bit hard for some people to make work is you need like three tenants to make it work. And those three tenants have got to be compatible with each other. They've got to be able to co-live. And that has its challenges when you've got people with disabilities, the disabilities have got to be complementary, uh, all that sort of thing. So, um, Paul, I've seen it work really well. People get 8 10% rent returns. I've seen some people only get 3 or 4% and have, you know, an extra $100,000 that they've got to put into the the property cost itself. Certainly not something for first-time investors. Um, self-managed super fund, um, I guess I put self uh, super annuation full stop, but self-managed super in that category where you want to be fairly low risk um, because mm. it's your super, it's, it's your retirement fund. Um, do you want to be taking what I perceive to be a slightly higher risk investment property strategy inside of the self-managed super fund? Um, look, I don't think so. I think you could do, you know, maybe something like a dual occupancy that still gives you the uh, rent return, the higher rent return, but mm. doesn't have you taking that occupancy risk that sits within the NDIS. So, look, good point, Paul. I couldn't, in good conscience, say that uh, I think I would do it um, because I'm not doing it. Uh, but having said that, you might have a higher risk appetite. You might already be very well off financially and could afford to take those risks. But uh, I think for most people, it's not going to work. Uh, Ali wants to know, what is the right price to buy an investment property? Oh, that that's a great, interesting one because, and I know we say all questions are great, so sorry, I sort of started to pause myself as I was saying that. But it's kind of relevant because you, first things first, you've got to start with where you can afford. So really, it doesn't matter so much about the price. It matters more what your purchase capacity is, which is starting point A. You've got to start there. Um, but say you've got like a quite a high purchase capacity and you've got quite a bit at your at your selection, you know, say you, you can borrow up to a million bucks. Um, I think the right price is really um, – around or under the median house price in the respective state that you're looking in. You want to be somewhere that's relatively affordable for a renter, um, but also affordable for, for you to hold on a cash flow perspective. Um, so you've got to sort of not just look at what the price of the property is, but also what the rent is that it's going to be giving you um, because the, the yield on that will also dictate how easy um, or, or tax dependent it is for you to hold that property. I think the right price is not a one size fits all uh, in my opinion. But, you know, we've got clients as well uh, and, and James, you can attest to this that have got significant borrowing capacities, maybe up to one and a half million dollars. And rather than maxing themselves out and going and buying one eight or nine hundred thousand dollar property, they've actually bought two, uh, four, five hundred thousand dollar investment properties that have five percent yields, uh, are in really high growing areas and are relatively cash flow neutral to positive. You know, so you're sort of a little bit more conservative, um, but that might be sort of more perceived as as the right price. Um, so really, it, it's not so much solely about the price as it is 
the cash flow, your ability to hold it, your comfort with it, your risk appetite, so many different things. But hopefully, Ali, that gives you a somewhat of an answer that you were looking for. Here's a long one for you, Cuz. It's from Michael. I've got an unencumbered home in New Zealand and I've got a home here in Australia that I've got debt on. My goal is to be debt-free on my Australian home. So should I sell my New Zealand home to pay down my Australian home? If so, when's the best time to be doing that? And then he goes on to sort of unpack it further and say, should I renovate the property prior to selling? So this is like a triple combo meal from Michael. A three for one. Three for one. <laughs> three all right, for. Michael. Um, a three for. First of all, uh, only 31% of all Australians own their own home. So well done. Um, obviously yours is in New Zealand, but you still own your own home. Um, I, I think without knowing the numbers, you know, what the rent is, the tax position, capital gains, all those sorts of things, um, I, I think it's a great idea to sell the New Zealand home, use the proceeds to pay down the uh, the debt that you've got on the Australian home. Um First port of call for me would be speak to an accountant just to understand, yeah. you know, they're in different countries. So what's the tax implications? Mm. Um, what are you actually going to get if you sell it for X price, if you do it now, if you wait, all that sort of thing? Um, when would I be doing it? That would probably be the next port of call, I think. You know, I think I wouldn't be selling right now. Um, we're recording this in February 2022, uh, 23, sorry. Um, 2023. So look, I'd be sort of maybe waiting till the second half of 2023, uh, or at least the point where interest rates sort of start to plateau and even come back down slightly. I just think you'll get more people engaging and, and interested. Um, and then my second port of call after the accountant would therefore be the best agent. Um, websites like Rate My Agent uh, in Australia, realestate.com.au, mm. there'd be similar websites in um, uh, New Zealand. You can put in the postcode, the suburb. It'll tell you who's been the best agent in that area by number of sales. You can see some reviews, all that sort of thing. And I'd be getting the right agent. They're then going to be able to tell you whether you should spend any money on the property to, to get a better price. Um, you know, the rule of thumb is things like landscaping, fresh liquor paint, some, some carpet. Generally, you get a return on those sorts of things, but um, not always the case. Every Every house, every suburb is different. So a good agent who does really well in that local market that you're in is probably going to be the uh, the best person to guide you through that process when you do eventually um, come to the point of selling. Well said. And I think, Michael, you, you know what your goal is, and that's to have a debt-free house in Australia. So it's a, it's a good place to start, right? Your goal. Amen. That's bloody another quick shot. Wrap it up. That's another quick shot. Can you bloody believe it? <laughs> Thanks for listening to another episode of The Double Shot with your favourite cousins, Alex and James Fitzgerald. If you've got a burning question or something we absolutely need to talk about on the pod, please write to us. Both of our emails are in the show notes. For little real estate tidbits and a little bit of banter, okay, a lot of banter, you can follow us on the gram. Our handle is the doubleshot.podcast. That, my friends, is the doubleshot.podcast. Until next time, think of us when you sit back and sip your next double shot.